All right, before I pray tonight, I have just a few introductory comments. One of them is, I never intended to hide myself away the first day or so after we got here early Thursday morning. Um, really intended to come and be a part of this from the very beginning on Wednesday evening. But I am still thankful to be here tonight. And uh, the Lord has blessed me through understanding more about our history as Seventh-day Adventists and specifically about our um, history of 1888. And tonight isn't specifically on, directly on that topic. We'll get into that more tomorrow. But it, uh, I think, will be helpful to us. So, again, um, I'm glad you're here. And uh, as we start tonight, and I get all my clickers going, and let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here on this Sabbath evening or Friday evening as the Sabbath begins. And Father, most of all, we desire that you would be here with us. Lord, you have been through all the generations and seen it all. You know so much more than we do what has happened in the past and what is in the future. And so, Lord, it's to you that we look tonight and ask that you will bless each of us here, guide my words, I pray, Lord, that I would only represent you, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know who chose the theme for this year and when it was chosen, but to me, it's very fitting and I believe the Lord had his hand in it. It's midnight, time for a most precious message. I think that was chosen before COVID hit. And I do believe that it is time. Time more than ever for a most precious message. And yet, just as the devil has done for over 6,000 years since he started the rebellion, there are things that he will try to do and has done to try to disrupt that most precious message. And tonight and tomorrow afternoon, I want to touch in an, on an area where I believe that message, most precious message, can be challenged. Now tonight uh, is actually an introduction and tomorrow's the message. But without this introduction, the message tomorrow will not make as big of an impact until we have this uh, introduction. I also like to let everyone know that the PowerPoint will be available to uh, those who can put it up on the, the web page after the presentation. So if you're taking notes, don't uh, feel like you missed one. You can always pick it up uh, later. So as we begin tonight, let's start by looking at how the Lord has led us in the past. We're going to start with William Miller. Now, many of us have probably read about William Miller and some of what I'm talking about, many of you have already heard, but I think it's good to review. William Miller was born in 18, 1782. He was born into a Baptist home, but at the age of 21, he became a deist. At the age of 30, he was in the War of 1812, and he was almost killed. And at, after that event, he asked the question, what would have happened if I had died? And that shook William Miller. Well, when he, after the war, he returned back to uh, New Hampshire and he started attending the Baptist church again, still as a deist. But one Sunday when he was there, the pastor was gone and they asked him to read the sermon. And this happened several different weeks. And one week he read a sermon on the duty of parents. And this is what he says about his experience. Suddenly, the character of a savior was so vividly impressed upon my mind, it seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering the penalty of sin, I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be. And I imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust in the mercy of such a one. 
So William Miller, at this point in his life, ran in to the gospel. Before any of the rest of his life events happened in his reconversion, it was the gospel that brought him in. Well, William Miller began to study the Bible. A few years later, he systematically took a Bible and a concordance, and he began to study and read. And this is what he discovered that impressed him after two years of intense study. I was thus brought in 1818 at the close of my two years study of the scriptures to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. That in about 25 years the glory of the Lord would be revealed. Now this was a, a seed or an impression from his study that continued to grow. And in his studies, William Miller also studied through the prophecies. That's how he came to the idea that Jesus was coming within 25 years. He read verses like Numbers 1434, where God judged Israel a year for each day of the rebellion there at Kadesh Barnea. He read Ezekiel 4.6, where something similar, Ezekiel was to lay on his side, representing uh, a day on his side for each year of, the, uh, of uh, the iniquity of Judah. And other verses as well led him to the study of the prophecies, including the, in Daniel 8 and 9, where he studied about the 70 weeks, the coming Messiah who would sacrifice his life, return to heaven, and there would be a period of time of ministry and then a culmination in what William Miller figured was 1843. Now this is not a William Miller chart, but I'm just showing you that chart. It basically shows the plan of salvation. Christ's work in the courtyard, Christ's work in the holy place, and then Christ's work in the most holy place. Now William Miller didn't understand this at that point, but he understood prophecy, he understood the year day principle. So he also studied the other prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. He understood the 1260 years that there was this church state, papal uh, power during a dark ages in Europe, and that the saints had suffered under this power and that that power would come to an end. But William Miller was not the one that discovered this idea. He was building upon others that had gone before him. The year day principle was understood all the way back even to the time of the disciples when Jesus came after the 70 weeks. They knew he would, the time was fulfilled and that was based on the understanding of the year day principle. Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Zwingli, Martin Luther, Melanchthon, Knox, and Calvin, as well as John Fox, and many others who understood this year-day principle of prophecy. And they recognized that they were living in those dark ages and they were seeking to reform the church of that time. Now just a quick mention here, of course, after the beginning of the real reformation there in the 16th century, there were several Jesuits, Francisco Ribera and Robert Bellarmine, who, in order to take this biblical truth or prophecy that pointed out the man of sin and the corruption that was taking place in this church state union, they did away with the year day principle and made them literal prophecies that applied to the end of time, futurism. Louis Alice, uh, Alcazar was where we get the idea of preterism, which was get rid of the year day principle, put all those prophecies in the past, they were all fulfilled in the past, and thus the truths of the scripture were put aside and the pressure was off that church state union. But other reformers kept the light going. Newton, 
Whitfield, Wesley Brothers. And in uh, Ellie Froome's books, uh, four volumes set on the prophetic faith of our fathers, there's many charts in there that show the reformers who believed in the year day principle and taught these things, even though they may not have all uh, figured their days exactly right, they had a basic understanding. And William Miller was one of these people in that train of reformers down through the ages. And after about 12 to 15 years of study, William Miller had an experience one Sunday morning. Sorry, one Saturday morning. And this is how he describes it. One Saturday after breakfast in the summer of 1833, I sat down at my desk to examine some point and as I arose to go out to work, it came home to me with more force than ever go tell it to the world. The impression was so sudden and it came with such force that I settled down into my chair saying, I can't go, Lord. Why not? Seemed to be the response. And after this exchange for a while, William Miller says, my distress became so great, I entered into a solemn covenant, covenant with God that if he would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. Now, of course, as many of you know, William Miller thought that that was a good way to get rid of that burden. And within a half an hour, the Lord had an answer with a knock at the door. And it was his nephew, I believe, coming over to let him know that the pastor at the local church, eight miles away, I believe it was, needed somebody to preach and wanted to know if William Miller would do it. Well, after a agonizing time of prayer out there in his prayer spot, William Miller agreed to do what he had said he would do. And the beginning of his preaching started that summer in 1833. Three months later, the stars fell. On November 13, 1833. Now this was kind of the culmination of signs as described in the Bible, Matthew 24 and other places, of events that would happen before Jesus returned. And these events solidified in Miller's mind that what he was studying was true. Jesus was coming soon. And of course, even in Miller's generation, they could not forget what had happened in November 1, 1755, 80 years, approximately 70 years before, when the biggest earthquake to that known to that date had happened. They, they figure today, I guess, 8.4 to 9.0 on the Richter scale. A city, Lisbon, 200,000 people almost wiped off the map in one night through earthquake, fire, and flood. It was felt in Africa, Greenland, Europe, the rest of Europe, even into the Middle East. It was such a powerful earthquake. That had been followed on May 19, 1780 by what was known as the Dark Day. Day started out normal at uh, mid-morning. By noon, it was like dark at night. And when the moon came out that night, it shone red as blood. And so another sign, all of these people taking note 1798, the uh, French Revolution had begun in 1789 through 1799, the Reign of Terror, 1792 to 1795, the Goddess of Reason where uh, oppression on the one side was traded for oppression on the other. And by the way, I think the study of the French Revolution might be worthwhile today as our country is going through something similar. Then, of course, this was capped in 
1798, when Napoleon took Pope Pius VI captive and the deadly wound which is mentioned in Revelation took place. And many of these things were noted by Miller and others before him. And for Miller, it meant Jesus is coming soon. And as he went out to preach, Revelation 14, 6, and 7 was beginning to be proclaimed. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. But how could William Miller do this alone if he was the only one proclaiming this message. Well, he was not. There was others who joined him. And each one of these people in the Millerite early Advent movement have a story behind how God used them. Charles Fitch, Josiah Litch, Hiram Edson, Joshua Hines, Isaac Welcome, George Storrs, Phoebe Palmer, and then some guy by the name of George Duffield IV. He was a Presbyterian minister, wrote a book called Duffield on the Prophecies, and he was a part of the Millerite movement. His son actually wrote the hymn in our Adventist hymn book today, that's there today. Anyways, if there's a resemblance there, uh, it may be about eight generations back, but That was in the United States. What about other countries? Joseph Wolf, Dr. He was in uh, Europe. Dr. Uh, Abraham Capasados, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He was in Holland. Lacunza, who wrote under the um, name Ben Ezra because, so, because his books were banned uh, from Spain. And Francisco Romer, Romos Mexia. He was a Sabbath-keeping uh, individual from Argentina who was proclaiming a very similar message to what William Miller was doing in the United States. So God was working in this movement. Well, in uh, Maxwell's book on the, the uh, Tell It to the World, this is what he describes about those that were involved. But no one knows how many helpers there were. Contemporary estimates ran from 700 to 2,000. Of 174 known ministers, about half were Methodists, fourth were Baptist, and the rest included Congregationalists. Christians, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Dutch Reform, Quakers, and several others. It cannot be overstressed that Miller was not the only leading Millerite. But he was one of the prominent ones and of course one that um, was intimately involved from the beginning. This is how, what Loughborough says uh, in his book, The Great Second Advent Movement. He was alive during this time and he wrote of his experience. This is what he says. Elder William Miller had the names and addresses of 3,000 ministers in various parts of the globe who were proclaiming, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The greater portion of these being in North America and Great Britain, but obviously there was those around the world. And this is in the day, remember, before phones and internet and all that we rely on today to get our work done. And yet God can do it without any of that. And he did in the 1840s. Well, again, all these men that worked with uh, William Miller understood the year day principle. 1260, the 1290, the 1335, 2300 years, 
prophecies about the Antichrist and so forth. And they saw a culmination of these prophecies in those end time years, 1798 to 1843. Again, another graph from Froome's uh, four volume set. I know you can't read this, but there's 88 individuals during this Millerite movement that he collected data on who believed that the 2300 days would end between 1843 and 1847. And they were preaching that message. Well, there's something happened in the summer of 1840. The, like I said, the Millerite movement was built on historicist understanding or interpretation of the prophetic books. And Josiah Litch had been studying into the trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9. And he had seen the time prophecy in both the fifth and the sixth trumpet and had worked through that and came to the conclusion that these, the sixth trumpet was in the process of being fulfilled. Now, I wish I could, you know, do a whole hour, Jerry Finneman would do, has done this, on the trumpets. It's because it's an important part of our Adventist history. But just uh, as a very quick summary, the seven trumpets have been understood to, to basically cover from the downfall of Western Rome, the first four trumpets, to the trumpet five and six, the downfall of Eastern Rome, the rise of Islam and the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and then the seventh trumpet depicting the downfall of the world. But in Josiah Litch's um, study, as he went to these prophecies, and he looked at the sixth trumpet specifically, and he looked at the, the, a very unique uh, time prophecy in this trumpet that's specific down to the very, to a day. And he figured that out to come out to 390, 391 years and 15 days. Now, by the way, he was not the only one who had studied into this. There were others. But Josiah Litch was the first to put it on an event happening in the world. Again, another way of figuring out that date from the sixth trumpet. And as he lined it out, this is how he, see, he saw it fitting. The fifth trumpet, the time prophecy of the fifth trumpet ending in 1449. And then that time prophecy of the sixth trumpet with its 391 years and 15 days ending on August 11, 1840. So this is how he describes it in, uh, or actually Loughborough describes it in his book. In 1838, Dr. Josiah Litch of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, having embraced the truth set forth by William Miller, united in the work of giving greater publicity to the message. He prepared articles for the public print on the subject of the seven trumpets of the revelation. He took the qualified position that the sixth trumpet would cease to sound and the Ottoman power fall on the 11th day of August 1840. And that that would demonstrate to the world that a day, notice, that a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year of literal time. So catch what his thought was in this that if it is shown that prophecy in the Bible the year day principle comes true then people will see that that year day principle applies to the other prophecies that we as the Millerites are talking and proclaiming to the world Now, Loughborough, again, continues in his uh, book a description. Notice what he says here. P 
Public journals spread abroad the claim that he, Lich, had made on the subject. Infidel clubs discussed the question in their meetings and said, here's a man that ventures something and if this matter comes out as he says, notice how they make the connection, it will establish his claim without a doubt that a day in prophecy symbolizes a year and that 2300 days is so many years and that they will determine, terminate in 1843. So think of it, now this, you know, again, in the days before internet and phones and texting and all of that, but the word got around and it was probably the talk at the bars and the shops in the, where people, men and uh, women would, would discuss this claim that was being published about. Would that make you nervous today if, if you were a part of that kind of movement? What are the possibilities that this fails? Well, here's a, uh, another statement that Loughborough makes. The publication of Dr. Litch's lecture made a general stir, and many thousands were thus called to watch for the termination of the difficulties that had sprung up between Muhammad Ali the Pasha of Egypt and the Turkish Sultan. Hundreds said, if this affair terminates as the doctor has asserted, it will establish the year-day principle of interpreting symbolic time and we will be Adventists. Now why would they say we will be Adventists? Well, because the time prophecies that were being proclaimed at the same time were Jesus is coming. The end of the 2300 days. All these other prophecies, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335, have come to an end. And if this prophecy in the sixth, fifth and sixth trumpet came true, they would become Adventists. This is what Ellen White had to say about um, the Advent movement at this time when the first angel's message was beginning to sound. The event, talking about what actually happened, the fall of the Ottoman Empire on that very day, that event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of the prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. So just as like people had said, if this happens, we'll believe. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and publishing his views and from 1840 to 1844 work rapidly extended. Now this generally is actually, 1840 is actually really pointed to the time in which the first angel's message really seriously began to pro be proclaimed. And it was that prophecy that God had given in the fifth and sixth trumpets that Josiah Litch had studied out and published in pamphlets and newspapers that had actually lifted this Millerite end time event movement to um, the power that it became. Here's what Hiram Edson uh, said in a book lit on uh, this prophecy. And the events of August 11, 1840 was to the Advent movement what the power of steam is on the machinery of the railroad locomotive. So you can have a skeleton there, but when you add that steam, things start moving. So from the 11th day of August, 1840, the Advent cause and message, or the angel, careered on its way with greater power than ever before. And as it rolled through to every nation and kindred and tongue 
and people crying with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, etc. Hiram Edson, in the time of the end, is beginning progressive events and final termination. So again, this event of 1840 strengthened the uh, Advent movement. Again, this is what uh, Loughborough wrote about what happened after the fact. Dr. Litch said that within a few months after August 11, 1840, he had received letters from more than 1,000 prominent infidels, some of them leaders of infidel clubs, in which they stated that they had given up the battle against the Bible and had accepted it as God's revelation to man. Some of these were fully converted to God and a number of them became able speakers in the great Second Advent movement. Now again, I cannot perhaps overemphasize the importance of this prophecy to the whole Millerite movement, which is the foundation upon which our church grew out of. And the reason I, I bring it up tonight, and we'll touch on it again tomorrow, is because that prophecy has been called into question since the turn of the 20th century, 19 teens. And as a people, we have shied away from that prophecy to the point where it's not something that we actively talk about in its context of fulfillment and the power that it gave to that early Advent movement. Now thankfully there are, and uh, tomorrow I hope to show that there are uh, scholars that have begun to study again into this and they say, we, we gave up too quickly on this prophecy. There's evidence, more evidence than ever before, that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Well, here's another um, graph or diagram of a list of 86 expositors that um, was in a ministry magazine in uh, 1944. Now, I know you can't read those and I can't either, but there's uh, 86 of them, along with Josiah Litch, who proclaimed the idea of the fulfillment of prophecy with the sixth trumpet. What's interesting is that sixth trumpet paved the way for the events that happened after that. that in chapter 10 of Revelation. And when you reinterpret the trumpets to the future, what do you do with all the history that's been lined up up to this time. Well, after that event in uh, 1840, Millerite journals began to pop up to the number of about 30 over the next four years. There were 17 million people in the United States at that time. And 30 journals started proclaiming the message of the Millerite movement. There was everything from a four-page tabloid up to a 148-page scholarly quarterly. And they estimate over five million copies were distributed by May of 1844 with the idea that some of the greatest distribution happened after May of 1844. And here's actually a, another diagram showing up there on your uh, left-hand side, 1840, there was one magazine, Signs of the Times. After that, they progressively grew over the next few years uh, to the number of 30 periodicals or journals proclaiming the message. Well, there was camp meetings as well. And this is a sketch of Fa Father Miller's tent and campground at Newark. Other pictures you may have seen of camp meetings gathering around the country here in the United States. They estimate that 500,000 attended in about a two-year period to hear 
the message is being proclaimed. Now again, that's when the population is 17 million. That would be equivalent today to if we had 10 million visitors show up at our camp meetings during the summer with the population we have now. Well, another event happened in the, uh, at a conference in 1842. What I find interesting is as these Millerites progressed along in this movement, they were continually studying their Bibles and they found within the scripture stories and texts that applied to the movement itself. And this was one that they had read in Habakkuk 2, uh, verses 2 to 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tables or tablets, that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. So Charles Litch had come to a uh, conference in May of 1842 and he brought with him a canvas in which he had painted or had someone paint some of the dates and the prophecies and the figures and while he was there he basically suggested that it would be a help for him and other evangelists if they had this type of canvas um, chart to share in their evangelistic series. So this is um, what Joseph Bates wrote about the event. He says, in May of 1842, a general conference was convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, Brethren Charles Fitch and one other presented the pictorial prophecies of Daniel and John, which they had painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. After some discussion on the subject, it was voted unanimously to have 300 similar to this one lithographed which was soon accomplished, and they were called the 43 charts. And some of you have, have seen, you know, re, uh, copies of these in a uh, big uh, two by three foot sheet uh, that have been reprinted by the Heritage Center. And this was uh, V. Himes who produced this one. It has the prophetic dates, it has the, tw the 2300 year prophecy, the 70 weeks showing the time of Christ coming, his death. It shows the prophecies of Daniel 2 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 12. It shows the trumpets. And all the evangelists would take these charts and could refer to them. And of course there's lots of uh, intricate writing in there that they could refer to, not necessarily that people could read from out in the audience, but that they could refer to as they were presenting this subject. And this is how Ellen White talks about it in The Great Controversy. She says, as early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it, had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the Revelation. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. So again, notice how they saw, even within the scriptures they were studying, a fulfillment of the very movements, almost sometimes day by day, month by month, and year by year during this movement. So again, here's Miller and others who would use this chart going from church to church and city to city sharing the message of a soon coming savior and thousands were converted and came to the realization that indeed Jesus was coming soon now this is not a Miller chart but I had uh, one of my daughters help me adjust a chart I found to kind of give a pictorial of this more in a linear sense of all the prophecies they were looking at. 
Of course, the 2300 days with the 70 weeks, 1290, 1335, the 1260, which also is referred to as 42 months or the three and a half times. And William Miller also, and uh, jo uh, Joshua Himes and others, um, also believed in what was understood as the 2520. Now, I'm going to mention that a little bit tomorrow. But basically, they understood, each of them understood a little bit different. Uh, Himes applied it to a judgment on northern Israel. William Miller applied it on the judgment on Judah or, or the southern Israel. Himes had it ending in 1798 and Miller had it ending in 1843. One thing I would like to bring out just now, because this has become an issue among some, is the important fact, regardless of the truth or not truth of this particular prophecy that they understood at that time, it ended by 1843. And tomorrow we'll see how, as the church, as that movement went on, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church began, this part of the prophecy was put aside because they realized it didn't need to be added to the 2300 days to show that fulfillment had taken place in uh, 1844. But again, all of these prophetic times in the Bible culminated in those years time would be no longer and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Well this is how um, Ellen White wrote about the results of this uh, worldwide movement. The results were actually twofold. Many like I said joined the movement believing in the soon coming of Christ but others didn't want to hear that and they mocked it and there was persecution arose from this time forward. This is what she says in um, early writings. I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time in 1843. Thousands were led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller and servants of God were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the message. The preaching of definite time called forth great opposition from all classes, from the ministers in the pulpit down to the most reckless, heaven-daring sinner. Preachers and people joined to oppose this message from heaven and to persecute William Miller and those who united with him in the work. And you know, Loughborough talks about some of the persecution and it was actually quite amazing. People standing outside the church, you know, making a racket people throwing, you know, food at them, people actually planning to uh, murder one of the preachers, Millerite preachers. Here's a picture of some of the, the satire that came out during that time. I believe this one was something about William Miller needing, you know, put in a safe in April of uh, 1844. Other ones, of course, this one obviously has been made color, but the Millerites waiting for the world to come to an end. Here's one that's probably been seen to a uh, mil mil uh, grand ascension of the Miller Tabernacle. So even in the papers, there was satire and mockery of that Advent movement that had spread so thoroughly across this country and around the world. Well, some people were actually asked to leave the churches that they were attending. Now, remember, this Millerite movement was made up of members from many different denominations. Ellen uh, Harmon, at this time, and her father and family were part of the Methodist Church. And she describes in Life Sketches how her family was dealt with because of their belief in the soon coming of Christ. Notice what she says. Our family were, were all interested in the doctrine of the Lord's soon coming. My father had long been considered one of the pillars of the Methodist church where he lived. And the whole family 
had been active members. However, the Methodist minister made us a special visit, took the occasion to inform us that our faith and Methodism could not agree. The next Sunday at the commencement of the love feast, the presiding elder read off our names, seven in number, as discontinued from the church. This was in September of 1843. And they were some of the first to be kicked out of their church for believing in the second coming. Well, spring of 1844 came. Now, when Miller had taught at, from the beginning, he had said that 2300 days will, 2300 years will end in a, sometime during a, a year period between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. So when they approached that spring of 1844, there was what was, I guess, known then as a, you know, was a disappointment. Not the great disappointment, but a disappointment. And there was continued study and trying to understand what, what they weren't understanding. This is how Ellen White describes it in early writings. I saw the people of God joyful in expectation, looking for the Lord, their Lord, but God designed to prove them his hand covered a mistake in the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. Light from the word of God shone upon their position and they discovered a tearing time. Though it, the vision tarry, wait for it. They were prepared to receive the message of the second angel. So what had happened then is they, one of the things that happened was in their, William Miller's figuring and others, when they went from before Christ, B.C., and to A.D., they had added a zero there, which of course extends that time out so that the 2300 days would end sooner. You get rid of the zero, the date moves back, and the 2300 years ends in 1844. And this is one of the things that they studied out. Well, there was something more. Samuel Snow had been studying, and he understood that um, they should apply the end of the 2300 years to the specific event, the Day of Atonement. So notice what um, Arthur White writes about this in his book, uh, The Early Years. A careful study of types and antitypes led to the observation that the crucifixion of Christ took place on the very day in the yearly round of the ceremonies given to the Israel when the Passover lamb was slain. So it happened in the spring, just like the Jewish system. Would not the cleansing of the sanctuary typified by the Day of Atonement, falling on the tenth day of the seventh month, likewise take place on the very day in the year celebrated in the type. This, according to the true Mosaic reckoning of time, would be October 22. Early in August of 1844, at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, this view was introduced by Samuel Snow, and it was accepted as the date for the fulfillment of the prophecy of the 2300 days. Now, George Storrs also was studying. He'd been studying the ten virgin prophecy in Matthew 25. And he came to understand this tearing time about that Christ had tarried during this period. And while the bridegroom tarried, they had all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And all of these thoughts and ideas and studies came together in that summer late and uh, early fall of 1844 and this is how the midnight cry began and this is how Ellen White describes that midnight cry believers saw their doubts and perplexities removed and hope and courage animated their hearts the work was free from those extremes which are ever manifest when there is human excitement without the controlling influence of the Word and the Spirit of God. Of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that autumn of 1844. 
And you know, I feel like we need that time again. Well, what happened? That midnight cry went out, and of course there was a separation. They called people to join this movement, or people, they were pushed out of their churches. In every part of the land, light was given upon the second angel's message, and the cry melted the hearts of thousands. It went from city to city and from village to village until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. In many churches, the message was not permitted to be given, and a large company who had the living testimony left these fallen churches. A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry, and this is where they describe that second angel's message being proclaimed as well, along with the first. Well, what happened? A disappointment. And... Uh, Kelly talked about this the other night. So what Hiram Edson said, I don't think we can enter into the agony of these brethren and sisters who were there. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawned. But what about all those prophecies? Were they true? Maybe not, maybe they didn't understand fully, but were those time prophecies true? This is how Ellen White describes the events after the disappointment. Jesus did not come to the earth at the waiting of joyful company expected to cleanse the sanctuary by purifying the earth by fire. I saw that they were correct in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. Prophetic time closed in 1844. Their mistake consisted in not understanding what the sanctuary was and the nature of its cleansing. Jesus did enter the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary at the ending of the days. So something did happen. Jesus didn't come and cleanse the earth by fire, but it was a continuation of the plan of salvation as seen in the sanctuary service. And then notice, the whole point of this introduction tonight is, are these points. The preaching of a definite time for the judgment in giving of the first angel's message was ordered of God. The computation of the prophetic periods on which these messages, message, which, sorry, on which that message was based, placing the close of the 2300 days in the autumn of 1844, notice what she says, stands without impeachment. The repeated efforts to find new dates for the beginning and close of the prophetic periods and the unsound reasoning necessary to sustain these positions not only leads minds away from the present truth, but throws contempt, notice, upon all efforts to explain the prophecies. And this is the problem that we as a people have faced since that time. I'm not talking about the official Seventh-day Adventist church, but individuals among us who have led into these speculating things and are turning us away from that most precious message that is what we need at this time. Notice as Ellen White continues here, the more frequently a definite time is set for the second advent and the more widely it is taught, the better it suits the purposes of Satan. After the time has passed, he excites ridicule and contempt of its advocates. So notice there's that portion, but there's a second, and this is where Satan is getting at. And thus cast reproach upon the great Advent movement of 1843 and 1844. Those who persist in this era, era will at last fix upon a date too far in the future for the coming of Christ. Thus they will be led to rest in a false security and many will not be undeceived until it is too late.
And this is a real problem. Now, I spent three months scouring through review articles from 1849 to present. And I was amazed, especially during those early years, from the 1850s to, to early 1900s, how many Adventist pioneers talked about the detriment that time setting and going ahead of the Lord and trying to figure out new prophecies was to the Advent movement. And just so you know, I, I started just a list of dates of not individuals, but dates that individuals have looked to and tried to make something happen which has detoured our attention from what God did in the past and, as we'll see tomorrow, during the very time when that most precious message began to be proclaimed, this kind of time setting increased. And it was the devil's attempt to turn the attention from the prophecies which ended in 1844 pointing to the only thing left to do and that was Christ working in heaven in cooperation with his people on earth to prepare for his coming. He's not waiting on another prophecy to be fulfilled. He's waiting on us. And we're 175 years from this 1844. That's just some of the dates. I was shocked. I remember growing up hearing different things, but these are different dates. Again, no official Seventh-day Adventist proclamation of any dates, but many Seventh-day Adventist members and those who are some very sincere wanting to help the Lord. But it's a distraction to what the Lord wants to do to get us ready so that he can come. So again, tonight, this is an introduction of what I want to present tomorrow that leads into that question or statement, it's midnight. It's time for a precious message. There are people today, I've gotten books, I've seen stuff on the internet with all the COVID and the things that are going on that's seeking to take us off in different directions. That's not where we need to be. It's the most precious message we need to be centering on. Let's pray. Father, I pray tonight that we would again see the amazing things you did in that 1844 movement. Lord, that you would help us see that you're waiting for us to work with you, to be prepared for your soon coming. Lord, may our hearts be open to you tonight and every night. And Lord, as we enter these Sabbath hours, I pray that you will pour out your spirit upon us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>